We'll be looking at Bayes' theorem for two events and three events. We'll go through the proof and then do two examples. It's uh, important to know that Bayes' theorem in, in, um, includes infinitely many events. However, for a math um, IBAAHL syllabus, the maximum you'll be required to do is two events. So let's start with the proof for Bayes' theorem for two events, and then I'll explain how and when we use this theorem. So we start with the fact that you have, um, we know this fact which comes from the conditional probability. So we know the formula for conditional probability and uh, we, we are basically rearranging the conditional probability formula to get something like this where the intersection is the subject. And we can do the same thing with probability of A given B as well. So probability of A given B is uh, the following, and we get the same expression. Now, if we look here, uh, we get the same, um, we get two different expressions for the same thing. So A intersects B, which is the same thing as saying B intersects A, um, and so on. So um, we can use the same, uh, we can use the two expressions and equate them, because uh, they represent the same thing. So we get that this is equal to this. So A times uh, B given A is equal to B times A given B. Now, if I rearrange it and I want to make uh, B given A the subject, then I will get the following. So this is kind of the first part of Bayes' theorem. We're still not done because I can write it and improve it even further by looking at P of A uh, in here. So before I move forward, there's also the, obviously the symmetry as well. So if I do A given B, I get the following as well. So keeping that in mind, but we'll just be considering one case and it falls the same if we switch the letters. So what happens if I have this and I can improve it further? So I want to improve this P of A. Well, remember that P of A is um, the same thing as taking the intersection of A with B uh, added with the intersection of A and not B. So if we look at a Venn diagram, uh, an A intersect B would be the following shaded area and then an A intersect not B would be um, the following area. And by combining both of them, I end up getting A itself. So this is like a different way of um, It's like a different way of finding uh, probability of uh, A. So uh, I can rewrite this again using the facts from here. Probability of A intersect B is probability of B uh, uh, times A uh, given B and so on. So I can continue with the same thing. Now you might be wondering, well, why did we not pick um, the, um, the, the first one? Why did we pick the second one? Um, well, the reason is I wanted just uh, P of B and B prime to be included in there. So using this fact, P of A can be found not only by P of A, not only by the intersection, but also by taking conditional probabilities and multiplying them. And it's a combination of all of them. So this is the intersection of A and B. This is the intersection of A not B. And by combining them, you get P of A. So using this, I can now rewrite my uh, formula from here and I have uh, the probability of B given A is the probability of B times A given B, and the denominator is now all the combinations that I need to give me P of A. So uh, it combines all the tiny, tiny parts of P of A. Now, why is this useful? Because sometimes in questions, um, we are given A, we, we have A given B, and we need to find B given A. So this is when it's useful, because you can use it. So in all instances, we get the A given B prime, but what if the question wants the reverse? That's where Bayes' theorem is useful. There are some questions that you can solve using Bayes' theorem and other methods. However, sometimes, depending on the question and the information given, you don't have enough information to solve it using a different method, and that's where Bayes' theorem is useful. So let's try with uh, this example. You can pause and read it. I'm not going to read it um, in the video. But I will outline some important facts. So um, we have uh, a sentence like this, probability of train uh, running late. 
is 1 over 7. So this is, this is giving us the 1 over 7 as a conditional probability. And the probability of it's running late on root b is 1 over 9. Now, you can do all of these using a tree diagram, by the way. And it works exactly the same. But it's, we're using these theorems to avoid doing, going the long route, especially if I just want a, a straightforward answer. So I want, um, the question wants me to find um, if I see a train that's late, what's the probability that it is a root B train? So the, let's, let's denote T of A as the probability of train A and T of B as probability that it's train B. So you have these trains. And then the other information we have is being late. So I know that um, the probability of being late given that it's train A, that's given to me as one over seven, and the probability of being late given that it's train B, that's one over nine, okay? So probability of you getting a train A, well, they're telling you that root A has three times as many trains as root B. So you have three out of four chances of getting a train from root A and a one over four chance of getting a train from root B. Now, it's important to know that these are conditional probabilities because they, um, and they're set up in this way where it's late given that you have the train at uh, A or B. Now, the question once, uh, it's telling you that a train is late. So this is the event that already happened. So what you are actually trying to find is it's already late. I know that that is given, but what's the probability that it is from a train B? So this is where Bayes' theorem is useful because I have uh, L given train B, uh, but I don't have train B given L. I'm saying, I'm saying train B, but I mean root uh, B. So using Bayes' theorem, you can go back to the video or see it, uh, have it written down. Uh, Bayes' theorem would then require me to take the um, the first value, so t of b, if we go back here, you'd notice it's the, the probability of b multiplying here. So I have the probability of train b multiplied by the kind of switching these letters around, probability of late given that it's train b. So that's the probability above. And you want to divide by the probability of l, but we know that this could be found differently, because I don't have the probability of being late. I have late given that and late given that. So I don't have only late. On a tree diagram, you can easily find it. So the calculation we're actually doing in the denominator is something you've done before on a tree diagram, but we're just doing it directly here. So to find the probability of just being late, you need to take each of these and multiply them with each other. Adding them together, that will give you the total probability of being late. So three over four times one over seven, plus 1 over 4 times 1 over 9. Um, so I should have written this in notation first. I'll put up the numbers later. So we have um, probability of train A and probability of being late, given that it's train A, plus probability of train B, which looks like the numerator, but they don't cancel out, obviously. All right, so putting in the numbers, we have a 1 over 9 times 1 over 4 over 3 over 4 times 1 over 7 plus 1 over 4 times 1 over 9. Obviously, I'm switching some of the numbers around. But uh, simplifying this and into decimals, we get this. That's the three significant figures. So that's the probability of if I see a train that's late, so that's the given part, uh, what's the probability that it came from a uh, root b? So that's the answer. The formula is there. Okay, so um, by definition, because we have two events, if you have a, you'll notice the notation takes b complement, which makes sense if you have uh, t of a. t of b is just basically the complement of t of a. So we could also have written this as t of a uh, complement. Um, that's an alternative notation. Now what happens when we extend it to three events? So imagine you have this set and you have so many events happening in there. Um, so this is kind of an idea of what's happening. So it's not just do two events, two circles. You have many events. 
<clears throat> and they're all mutually exclusive, so they don't intersect each other. Um, so let's say for i and it's one to n, you have all of these events, they're mutually exclusive. So um, if you take the union of them, this will be the probability, and they all represent uh, the union. So, and I know that uh, they all add up to one. So these are all important facts for us to prove Bayes' theorem for um, infinitely many events. So if I let B be an, an arbitrary event in the sample space, so you can look at the diagram, you can see that B is just part of that space. Um, so the idea is that uh, B intersects some of them and B is part of some of them, but I can't single out B as an event because it's A1, A2, A3 that are my uh, mutually exclusive events. So if I need the probability of one of these A's, so AI, I don't know which I it will be, but AI, uh, given B, then it looks exactly like the two events basis theorem, where the numerator will take the uh, probability of the event that you're trying to find times the conditional probability, but it's switched. And keeping in mind that the I represents the event you're looking for. So maybe you're focused on A2 given B. And then the denominator does the exact same thing. We're taking the intersections of B with each of the events and adding them all up because that's an alternative way of finding um, this is exactly probability of B. But in order to find B, what we're doing is I'm finding the intersection with this part, and then I'm finding the intersection with this part, and intersection here and here, and I'm adding them all up. And by doing that, I end up creating probability of B altogether. So this is what Bayes' theorem is. Um, if n is equal to 2, then A2 uh, is just the complement, which is what we had previously. And in an examination, you'll only be required to use Bayes' theorem for up to three events. So in the denominator, you'll only get three uh, terms being added. So let's have a look at the equation. So I've switched the notation, and here it's A given B, but you could have B given A. Same idea. Just note how the conditional probabilities are written. The first value is always here. The conditional probability is always switched in the numerator. And in, in the denominator, um, the I represents the different events. Because we're dealing with maximum three events, uh, you'll have to take the intersection with the first event, second event, and third event. Um, so that's adding them all together to give you probability of A. So this adds up to uh, probability of A. Now, I'm using the same example, but I'm just adding a third train uh, track. And um, I'm intentionally using the same example so that you can see how the question can, uh, is similar. So it's the same thing. You have roots A and B have the same number of trains, while root C has double their amount. So we'll discuss how this probability can be written. The probability of train running late on route A, B, and C are the following, respectively. Um, same idea, and I also want uh, root B. Um, so let's write them down. I have the probability of train A um, and train B and train C. So if C has double those amounts, we can say that it's uh, 2 over 4, for example, or 1 over 2. And those could be 1 over 4. OK. Uh, questions will be a bit clearer. I just wrote it in a worded format. But when it's three events, they might specifically tell you these are the probabilities. Uh, so it's not always worded, but it's a good idea to take those worded definitions and convert them to probabilities. So then I have the probability of the train um, being late, given that it's from root A. So that would be 3 over 5. And then the same thing for B. And the same thing for C. And then using Bayes' theorem, um, the question wants the probability that it's from train B, given that it's late. The late already happened. So we said at the top, we take the probability of this train B, which is 1 over 4. I'm just going to immediately write the numbers in. And then I'm multiplying it by the reverse. Um, maybe it's a good idea to write the notations. 
So we are taking the probability of train B times <clears throat> the reverse of the um, conditional probability. That's the whole point, <clears throat> is that you have this reverse conditional probability, and how can you use it? And then the denominator will be all the intersections possible such that you end up getting probability of L in the denominator. So that would be, I need to take it not just with B, I need to take it with every event that is associated with B, which is A, B, and C. So this is the, this is the one, the two, and the three events here. So this is your train A, train B, train C, or track A, track B, track C. So I'll start with A. And I need to multiply with um, the late given train A. And I need to repeat it again for B. And again for C. By doing that, I end up getting the probability for, um, sorry, it's a tiny font, uh, but the probability of L being in the denominator. So the top is gonna be one over four times two over seven, divided by uh, all of these multiplying together, and adding them up will give the intersections, which add up to give the probability of being late. So one over four times three over five, one over four times two over seven, plus one over two times one over eight. So in total, that gives you 0 0.252, that's the three significant figures. So that's it for Bayes' theorem. Hopefully it's clear now how, how and why we use them. Again, these are questions you could do on a tree diagram um, and you could sometimes solve them differently. Again, these are questions you could do on a tree diagram or solve them differently, but Bayes' theorem gives you a quick shortcut in case you have the alternative uh, conditional probability and you want the other conditional probability. So if you have A given B and you need B given A.